Hi everyone and welcome to our video on immobilized enzymes. What we're going to be doing in this video is covering the bit of the spec reference which is 6.2.1i, so still in our module 6 work and we're going to be looking at the uses of our immobilized enzymes and these different methods of immobilization. So what we need to make sure we include here is that evaluation, so looking at advantages and disadvantages. Now on your specification you'll notice that there's that whole bunch of different examples that could be included. The key word there is could. So we're going to have a look at each of those just to see how it works. Do you need to memorize them all in any detail? Absolutely not because these are just examples that we could include, not ones that you must know for your exam. So when we are talking about immobilized enzymes, if we think about the word immobilized, first of all, this basically means that we're stopping the enzymes from moving freely. So the reason behind doing this is to avoid our enzyme from mixing with the substrate and the products that we are making. So we're basically sort of holding that enzyme in one location so that we don't get that free mixing going on. If we're talking about enzymes that are not immobilized, we'll just refer to those as free enzymes, the ones that are somehow immobilized, of course, immobilized. OK, first thing, advantages. This is a common question on your exam papers is knowing advantages of using immobilized enzymes here. So what I've done is I've broken it down to three kind of key bullet points for us. First one, downstream processing costs are reduced. So downstream processing is basically what happens after we've made our product, it's moved down that little line, so to speak, in our production in, in part of the industry. And what we're looking at is what has to happen to that product to make it suitable for whatever use it has. Now, because our enzymes are immobilized, they're not freely mixing with our substrate, not freely mixing with the product. So that means that we don't need to extract the enzyme from the product. So that means it's going to be cheaper. So downstream processing costs reduced as there's no need to extract the enzyme from the product. In some past exam questions, that's actually been worth two separate marking points. Your first one for reduced downstream processing costs, second one for no need to extract the enzyme from the product there. Another one we can say is that enzymes are reused or recycled. So that reduces our cost there because if they're immobilized, then we can just obviously reuse them in a future process. And finally, because our immobilized enzymes are stabilized by the matrix that they are immobilized in or on, then we can actually use much higher temperatures than we could with that same enzyme if it was a free enzyme. Because by being immobilized, it basically stabilizes the structure and therefore means that we can use high temperatures, which means that we will get a faster rate of reaction and therefore we will generate our yield in a shorter time. As always, though, in biology, there are disadvantages to our process. Two kind of key ones to bear in mind here. Firstly, it's actually quite expensive to immobilize the enzymes initially. Now, that word initially is important, or we could talk about the fact that the startup costs are high, but make sure that you've got something in there that makes it very clear that your answer is saying that this initial or startup cost is high, not just the cost, because that's too vague. And as we've already found out, it can be cheaper in the long run. So expensive to immobilize the enzymes initially or expensive to start up or set up the actual process. As long as you've got that, you'll be fine. Second one on there is because of the way that we are immobilizing some of these enzymes, we can actually have some distortion of the active site, which means they're less active than the free enzymes. The other kind of question that comes up relatively frequently on these exam papers is about how we immobilize these enzymes. Now, this will generally be a one mark question here. So what we're actually looking for are a few key words that we need to know. We're going to go through what we mean by these processes as well in a bit more detail, just so you've got a greater understanding. But if you literally just learn the names of the process, you should be fine in most of the questions that I can recall seeing anyway. 
So the first method that we can use is this process called adsorption. Now, one key thing is when you're writing this, that AD must be there at the beginning. If you don't have adsorption, so you were to write absorption, it would be wrong. So you've got to make sure that you've got AD at the beginning, otherwise you've lost your mark. Now, in this process of adsorption, what we're actually doing is we're binding those enzymes to the surface by either hydrophobic interactions or ionic links. And the surfaces that we're binding it to are some kind of a porous substance, clay, glass beads, resin, porous carbon. Most common one is our little clay at the top there. Now, in terms of what we see as a result of this adsorption process, is that the active site is exposed to those reactants, but it can be distorted as a result of these hydrophobic and ionic links. Now, if we've distorted the actual enzyme itself, we've potentially distorted the active site. That means that obviously it's gonna reduce the enzyme activity. The second issue that we see is the thing that we delightfully term leakage. Now, leakage quite simply is where the enzyme detaches from the surface of that substance. And as a result of that, it ends up in our reaction mixture. The second way we can immobilize enzymes is using covalent bonding. So what we're going to do is again use our clay and we're then going to covalently bind our enzyme molecules to the surface. Now, quite often what we're going to do is we'll have our bit of clay, okay, so that's our clay there. We will then have our little enzyme, and I'll draw it like my little Pac-Man as usual. And then we will use this cross-linking agent, which allows us to actually join more of these little enzymes onto that little substance. So the cross-linking agent creates these cross-links, which are types of covalent bond. And again, that's held onto the surface of the clay there. In terms of one key advantage versus adsorption, then they're less likely to detach from the surface. Downside though, this can be expensive and we can still see distortion of the active site and that will obviously impact on the activity of the enzyme. Option number three is the process of entrapment. Now, as the name suggests, if we entrap something, we're basically putting it inside. Now, what we're putting it in is a matrix. So you get away with saying in a matrix on this one. And what we would have is something like calcium alginate or cellulose mesh. And then the enzyme is basically enclosed within that matrix. Now, big advantage, enzyme is unchanged. So we're not seeing that distortion of the active site. Downside, we've got to have some method for those substrate and products to diffuse in or out of that matrix. So quite clearly, this wouldn't work with a substrate that was not able to cross that matrix itself to reach the enzymes. Fourth one, membrane separation. Again, just that term, absolutely fine to get you the marks on how would we actually immobilize an enzyme type questions. Now, this one's quite straightforward. We've got our enzymes separated from the reaction mixture by a partially permeable membrane. And hopefully from the work we've done on osmosis, we know that partially permeable just means it's only going to allow certain substances to cross. Now, the certain substances must be able to cross must be the substrate in the product, obviously. So what we basically have is if you've got your little partially permeable membrane, then you've got your enzymes on one side and you'll have your substrate on the other. And then they're able to cross to obviously have their reaction with the enzymes and then the product can then cross back to the other side. So substrate and product must be able to diffuse through the membrane. The enzymes, however, must not diffuse through that partially permeable membrane. So what we're going to do then is because they did give us a list of different uses as examples on your spec, we're just going to go through these. But as I've said, you're not going to be expected to recall in any detail any of these examples because they are just examples that we have used in industry of immobilized enzymes. So our first one, glucose isomerase. Now, hopefully we know that because it ends in ASE, that is our enzyme. Now, Glucose isomerase is going to convert the glucose, which is one of our carbohydrates, into fructose. The reason that we do this 
is that we can then produce this stuff called high fructose corn syrup or HFCS. Now, the whole idea of this high fructose corn syrup is to provide us with a way of sweetening foods without using large quantities of it. So this means there's less going in than we would with, say, just glucose, which means that diet food, sweetness for diabetics, etc. This high fructose corn syrup really works there. Now, what we find is that if we compare this high fructose corn syrup in terms of the cost of it to sucrose, which is another substance we can use, then our high fructose corn syrup is cheaper. And because of that, we can then produce these foods for less, which means these companies can make more profit or sell them for less money, whichever way you want to view things in life. And therefore, that is why the food industry uses them quite extensively. Our second example, penicillin acyclase. Now, penicillin acyclase is actually the enzyme that we're going to be using to make our semi-synthetic penicillins. And you've probably heard of one of these, if not used it, amoxicillin. So basically, penicillin is that natural antibiotic that we have obviously encountered from the fungus. But these days, we can make these semi-synthetic ones like the amoxicillin key advantage of this is that it gives us a different antibiotic because as we hopefully know from our other work we are seeing an increase in antibiotic resistance particularly to things like penicillin that have been in very frequent use for many years now and therefore having alternatives when they're resistant to penicillin is always a good thing our next example is lactase now, lactase is an enzyme we should be familiar with from our module two work, and lactase is going to be converting lactose into glucose and galactose. So this is going back into your biomolecules work. The reason that we want to do this is because we can now produce lactose free milk. And this is something that's really important for those people who are lactose intolerant. So by using that lactase enzyme, we can break down the lactose and therefore provide milk that doesn't have lactose. And therefore lactose intolerant people have milk they can consume without their issues. Next example, amino acyclase. Now this produces pure samples of L amino acids. And these are actually really useful when it comes to synthesizing both pharmaceutical and agrochemical compounds. Now, what we mean by that, pharmaceutical is obviously different drugs that we use as medicines. Agrochemical is agricultural means. We also will find these L amino acids as additives in foods for both animals and humans. So by using this amino acyclase, we can produce these L amino acids in a wide range of different uses there. And finally, our last example is a glucoamylase. This is going to convert dextrins into glucose. Now, the dextrins will form when we hydrolyze starch. And when we then want to do things like producing our HFCS, okay, our high fructose corn syrup, this is what we can use. We can also use it in the production of gasohol, which is one of those more environmentally friendly products that we can use then obviously to run vehicles. Okay, so gasohol is basically a fermentation product that we can use to power cars, etc. As always, I suggest you subscribe to the channel so you can see when I upload another video and head on over to the website for the A-Level so you can see what other resources are available to help you in your study of A-Level biology.